Welcome back to the Crossboard Interviews 2022 in review. Today I'm sitting down with the leader of the Maverick Party here in Western Canada, Colin Krieger. Colin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's I guess pleasure. I should say welcome back to the show because this is your second appearance. The last time true. you were on, you were still candidate for the leadership. That's right. And so uh, thanks for having me back. It's my pleasure. So I want to start off with the basic question that uh, I, I usually start off with other interviews, but for the 2022 year in review, it's going to be a completely different question for you. It's how has 2022 been for you? Oh, what a what a ride. There's been so many things. If you had asked me 18 months ago even, or say two years ago, what I'd be doing today, uh, it was a much different landscape. The the uh, My ride through with the Maverick Party and into the leadership role has been, uh, has just been extraordinary. You... You, you, well, I, I, I want to say it was March or April when you were uh, acclaimed as, or not acclaimed, but you won the leadership. Correct. Yeah, it was in uh, uh, March the 14th, I do believe. Yes, yeah. it was here in Calgary. I mm-hmm. was there. I was uh, streaming and it screwed up. So anyone who's watching from Maverick people, sorry about that screw up for the live <laughs> YouTube, but I do apologize. We did get it fixed out later on. Um, you've had a large job ahead of you because the Mavericks don't have an MP. You have been crisscrossing Western Canada, I'm assuming. How has that process been going? Because I can imagine what you're hearing, particularly over the last 12 months, has changed drastically from when you were elected Mm -hmm. to when you're sitting down with me today. Oh, absolutely. And so in regards to uh, crisscrossing, I I do drive around as much as I possibly can. Uh, You know, obviously, I haven't been to everywhere yet. So I'm sorry, I am coming as soon as I can, I promise. Uh, Just give me a reason. I I love to to meet with Western Canadians that are open to exploring options into the federal provincial landscape, uh, and what the Maverick, what the Maverick Party can offer them as a way of, of a solution, a Western solution. And what is that solution? What are you hearing and what is that solution that people are looking for right now? Because if you would have asked someone in BC and Manitoba, Saskatchewan, even the Northwest Territories, it's going to be different for everyone. You're right. So Absolutely. what are people looking for right now? Well, in, from the Maverick Party's standpoint, and I must be honest at this point too, uh, makes it sound like I'm not always honest. I do try. Absolutely. And if you catch me uh, saying something, please call me on it. But anyway, uh, I want to listen to everybody. At this point, I would by no means say that I'm done and that our policy is complete. I want to make sure that we are talking with as many people as possible. And that's that's one of the reasons why we travel so much. Uh, face-to-face is good. And uh, But from the Maverick Party standpoint, at this point in time, the Western solution is really twofold. And, and we recognize it fully as a party. On one hand, we have the, the federal end of it, which is the, the line that, that we are seeking to fill. Uh, we recognize that Western Canadians' voices in, in the House of Commons has been woefully inac- uh, inadequate for a long time. You know, we, we vote in the same guys. We, we vote them in again and again. And then often when they get there, they fail to bring up the topics that we need them to address. The Maverick Party wishes to address that. So our ultimate goal is there's 111 seats coming up in the next federal election, whenever that is, in Western Canada. And by Western Canada, I would say Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, British Columbia, and the territories. That would be who we seek to represent. Now, there's 111 of them. If we can get 70 seats, eventually, obviously I'm not going to be naive and say it's going to happen immediately, but we know that it can happen. If that happens, the Maverick Party can represent Western Canadians in a way that has seldom ever been done, if ever. We will either form a loose coalition with another party to, to form power. That would be... Not our, the Liberals, though. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, they... I'm, Pretty sure they wouldn't like necessarily what we have to say, but Western Canadian interests, no matter who we join, will be absolutely represented. Yeah, you know that's our that's our core. You know, if it's good for Western Canada, that's what we're going to support. That's it. So that would be the first thing. Now, the other option would be, of course, if two other parties were able to uh, form a coalition, then we would quite naturally at that point become the official opposition. That's where the second half of our Western solution and our talking points come into place. 
because we're quite pragmatic, we realized that we need to make a permanent solution. We need to have something in Western Canadian uh, politics that will protect us in all circumstances. We've seen how weak an official opposition can be at times. This is where the second half comes into place. We recognize that the provinces themselves have a significant role to play. The, the provinces, the Western Canadian provinces need to stand up and assert the autonomy that they have available to them. There are things that they could be doing even right now. And uh, Danielle Smith, for instance, is showcasing that here in Alberta. But she isn't alone. Uh, Scott Moe with the, the Saskatchewan First uh, yeah. legislation is, is doing the same thing. And they have our wholehearted support because we view that as absolutely vital to complete this transformation of giving Western Canadians the, the, the fair deal, ultimately, that we have never had. And so it's a two-part. We need the federal, which is the, the role that the Maverick Party will have, but we recognize that the provinces must step up into these uh, autonomous uh, measures that they have available to them. You know. So you basically jumped into a conversation I wanted to have a little bit later, but let's do it right now. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have a... No, no, it's great because that's what I like about uh, candidates like yourself and people, leaders like yourself who know what they want to talk about. And when they're on the same wavelength as me, then <laughs> it's great. It makes right my job a lot easier. This is a friendly one. I'm, exactly. Yeah. Um, you talked about the Saskatchewan first. You talked about the uh, Alberta Sovereignty Act and the United Canada legislation i still don't understand what that whole hmm. means but yeah. that was the details that she released later uh, premier smith released later uh, in november um sovereignty autonomy has been big this must be a good time to be a maverick because you're basically just talking about that since jay hill was leader mm -hmm. to you now yep and you're saying Everything that we've talked about is now in the mainstream with Danielle Smith and Scott Moe. You're so right. Like I've had some people come to me and and and, and um, they're upset, perhaps even Danielle Smith is is taking our platform. Well, no, she's not. She's actually accomplishing the second part of our platform. She's doing the things that we as Western Canadians, because that's what this is all about, right? Is making sure that Western Canadians are properly represented uh, inside of Confederation. So she's doing it and we're, we're grateful. The other thing is, is that quite honestly, Danielle Smith's platform that she ran on was very, very maverick. Uh, you know, and I don't want to claim credit where credit isn't due because, you know, these ideas have been around for generations, really. And we are simply bringing them back to the forefront and making sure that, that they're being accomplished. So we're, we're excited for her and, and Scott Moe and looking forward to uh, the other provinces, you know, seeing the benefits and following suit. Earlier this year, we talked about uh, what you wanted to get done if you were elected. Mm -hmm. And one of that was set up EDAs in all the ridings within that first year. Yep. You're coming up to your first year by the end of next uh, April. Mm -hmm. How's that coming along? Because I just want to throw back to some of the old conversations. Absolutely. If you want to go back and listen to it, you should go back and listen to our first <laughs> interview. But anyway, so how's it going setting up EDAs? It has been a process. Um, it has not, and I'm going to be honest, uh, again, like honest, I want to be open. Uh, the Maverick Party wants to do politics differently, if you haven't known that already. Yeah. We want to be transparent. We don't want to necessarily hide. We're not going to uh, do that type of stuff. So I'm going to be open. And also, it has not been as quick as we were hoping. Uh, we are, had to do a lot of rebuilding. Um, you know, there's a bit of a changing of the guard and these types of things. So we are still very, very focused on EDAs. Um, because that's the, that's the foundation that every political party is built on. And then, and then encouraging them, giving them the tools that they need to, to begin memberships, uh, drives, right. And to build our overall membership. And so that has been, uh, that's been an ongoing process. So we're, we're working hard though. Is, has, has, has the idea of what the leadership role has been different than what you thought it was going to be when you first got elected? Because when you're a candidate, you don't really know, understand what a leadership role is because you're going to be put into a completely different role because mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people will know this. Colin was the candidate for Peace River West Lock where yep. I ran in 2015. 
Um, he was the, the candidate for the Maverick Party, and then you became the leader. So there was no transition. It was candidate, oh. leader, here you are. And has, has being leader been completely different than what you thought it was going to be like? I was always aware that I was going to need a team. And I have been really fortunate in in surrounding myself with some really smart people. And I honestly, I continue to look. Uh, we are building this team as we go. Uh, but we've had a good, good core of just dedicated, very smart people that are that are my foundation personally. And so I'm, I'm grateful for them. So um, I don't think anybody is ever ready is ever ready to say it that way. Uh, so I've been I've been uh, I've been stretched. That much is very true. So, uh, but it's been but going you're, well. You're, you're going well. Um, you're down in Calgary right now. We're mm-hmm. recording this in November. Um, it, Calgary is about to see a by-election on yeah. January third or uh, January first, if I'm not mistaken. The riding of Calgary Heritage. Yep. Please correct me. Yep. Uh, there we go. Even Colin knows, and I I should know this as the host, but I guess <laughs> not. Uh, Calgary Heritage. Bob Benzen is going to be retiring. He said as of the end of the, uh, this year, he's done by election. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are going to be looking at this by election because there's new leaders. There's a thri- or drive to have a anti liberal sentiment out here in Alberta. Mm-hmm. Are we going to see a Maverick candidate in the by election of Calgary Heritage in 2023 if it's called? Absolutely. And I do fully expect uh, uh, the MP, uh, Mr. Benson, to uh, to resign, as he had said. I, you know, I'm sure that that is uh, pretty much been established at this point. It just depends on if Trudeau wants to call an election. Uh, right. Now, he will step down, but you're right. That could absolutely happen. Uh, Trudeau does not need. He is. Uh, there are windows and there are legislations in place, uh, but there's not a lot of on-the-surface uh impediment you know uh, impetus for him to call an immediate election he will probably drag it on for as long as he can yeah. which um quite honestly means at this point we expect probably a late summer or early fall uh, election for that seat um that is that's the assumptions that we are we are working with and uh, we are absolutely going to run a candidate in that riding uh it's a it's a tremendous opportunity for the maverick party uh, because a uh, so many of the things that would influence a voter on a general election aren't in, aren't present during a by election. Nobody's worried about a changing of the government. They're allowed to vote their hearts. Um, I had a I had an interesting conversation with a, a, a gentleman that I respect uh, tremendously, and I said like, "What would be your advice as going forward?" He says, "Pray for a by election." <laughs> And uh, looking back, of course, to reform. Uh, back in the day, he was part of that whole uh, scenario back in the late 1980s, I think it was. And uh, they didn't win a seat in the 1987 election. 88 election. Right. Beaver River. Edward Gray ran yeah. against the PC. The day after the or a few days after the election, the gentleman had passed away. Right. From, uh, I, I think it was a stroke. I'm not 100% sure. And then... Like literally eight months later, in 1989, she became the first mm-hmm. reform MP. She's been on the show yet again. Go check it out. Really? Oh, I, you know, I want to meet Deborah Gray. I really would. Uh, tremendous record and, uh, you know, very good. So, so you, you want to emulate what the reform did in 89 and yep. then head into 93, which would be 2025 for us mm-hmm. with a good, solid standard. That's right. That that is, you know, it's a very obvious. It's not a secret, obviously, but it show it will show the general public that the Maverick Party is is a real force. That we're a real party for say that we are um, reputable. Uh, that we are solid. You know, we're not uh, off in the weeds on on any type of legislation or whatever. And it makes sense. Uh, we want to follow that. Absolutely, it's going to be interesting. I'm going to ask the. Uh... The, not the gotcha question, but I'm going to ask the question that's on a lot of people's minds over the last year. And I, I saw a bit of it come up in the last few weeks on social media. Um, Pierre Polyev is the conservative leader. Mm-hmm. Um, some media organizations, and I use that word quite loosely, um, <laughs> organizations are saying that the Maverick Party is now just a separatist party. Mm-hmm. They, are, they want to separate from Canada. They're never going to win because that's their mentality. Yep. Um, put it straight to me right here, right now, Colin. Is 
the Maverick Party changing from a pro sovereignty autonomous uh, part of Alberta to a more separatist part of Canada? No, not at all. That was absolutely a, a misnomer, if you will. That's not true at all. And it's true for a very basic reason is that, well, there's several reasons. Let's just qualify, right? The first thing is, is that as a federal party that is well outside of our jurisdiction, if a province, any province, should decide that they want to pursue the route of sovereignty or independence, that's up to the citizens of that province. There will be a referendum. It's well laid out in Canadian, uh, you know, inside of our laws, how this will happen. Uh, they will have a referendum. It will either pass or it won't. And at that point, the decision will be made by the citizens of the province. So the Maverick Party, as a federal party, has no part in that. So A, that's it's not even a real thing. Um, in, in conjunction with that, the Maverick Party is representing all of Western Canada. Uh, you know, here in Alberta, depending on the uh, which statistics you look at, the sovereignty sentiment is somewhere between 30 and 60 percent. And I'm not going to say which side of the spectrum I even think that is. It's not not relevant for me. It's up to the citizens of Alberta. Uh, but in Manitoba, there's not that sentiment. And I am here to to represent them as well. And, and if the people in Manitoba, uh, they just want to pursue the available autonomous measures that they have, like, you know, having their own police force, for instance, which I think is a great idea, needs to happen. Uh, you know, having their own pension plan, which would be financially the, a very good decision for them. Uh, you know, collecting our own taxes. All of these here things are available to the provinces right now without referendum, without having constitutional reform. And we believe that every province should pick them up. If that's as far as Manitoba wants to go for the benefit of the Manitoban voter, of course, then they have my absolute support and encouragement to do so. Uh, and so that's how we fall in regards to the whole, are we a separatist party or not? We're not. I want to stick on this line of questioning here for a second. I'm not trying to, because I think it is an important question heading into 2023 and a potential by-election here mm -hmm. in Western Canada. Um, some will say, and I'm not one of them because really it doesn't bother me, like whatever you vote who for whoever you want doesn't bother me at the end of the day. A vote is a vote. As long as you get out and vote, it's mm -hmm. a vote. Um, some will say, well, Pierre Polyev's in now. Mm -hmm. There's no need for the matter. Because he's from Western Canada, he knows these issues that we're talking about. But you said at the opening that the politics of the same of the two major parties has always been the same. We send them off to Ottawa, and they don't really do anything mm -hmm. for Western Canada. Exactly. How do you get through that? Are you hearing that still as the Mavericks is still growing as they're evolving into the now not the Jay Hill party but the Colin Krieger party? <laughs> and I want to make sure that uh, thank you for that. I appreciate the Colin Krieger party. But it's not, man. We are we are here as grassroots. Uh, it can never be the Colin Krieger party or any f future leader after me. We must represent our people. That's that's the way it must be. So I'm, forgive me for making no, the qualification. No, I, I completely understand that, right? Mm -hmm. It's just the yep. Maverick party under as, the leadership right. of Jay Hill. Uh, I, I think sure. I should have re rephrased okay. it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe, I, maybe I overreact on that a little bit. But I just want to make sure. Um, well, so here's where we'll say it's Justin Trudeau's liberal party, oh, yeah. Pierre Polyev's okay, conservative party. So given, given, I get it. So in regards to Pierre Polyev, uh, you know, and how do we need the Maverick Party? I would again look back at history. History is instructive, right? Uh, many people, if you and I were talking, uh, you know, or or many people, I would suspect in in Western Canada, who was the best prime minister that we've had from a Western perspective in a long time, and many people might say, Stephen Harper. My question back to them would be, if he was the best one for Western Canadians, why is that? Why is that? Give me the reasons why, the specific, and this is a much harder question, you know. I've had people say, well, he, you know, he reduced the GST, you know, he, he from seven to 5% is what he did. And I'm like, well, that doesn't really count from a Western Canadian. He did that for all Canadians. Uh, correct. Right. And, and so many of the things he did in, uh, were for all of Canadians as a prime minister must, I suspect, do. But none of the things that we absolutely need uh, from a Western Canadian perspective were accomplished. Uh, you know, making appropriate changes to the equalization formula. 
never happened. Uh, making the appropriate Senate uh, changes that would help us out in Western Canadian, from a Western Canadian standpoint, to balance the powers in Ottawa never happened. In fact, it's almost worse than that. He was negligent on those specific platforms. My thing that I always point out is that it really says less about Pierre and Stephen than it does about us. Because as Western Canadians, it seems like our our definition of a really good prime minister is one who just didn't make it worse and didn't make it better, right? And we we can't settle for that anymore. We need to reverse the tide. We need to make actual changes to these inequalities that have been there forever. And I like to point out the fact that Stephen Harper, when he was in the prime minister's chair, absolutely ignored his own policy papers that he wrote for Ralph Klein back in the day. You know, these things that he had said himself and then conveniently was either unable to, and I, you know, maybe I need to be fair. He's unable to. It's the system, really, that traps us. Because if he wants to continue in power, he has to uh, make sure that the people in southern Ontario and southern Quebec, the most populous areas of our country, are are um, heard first. So, so we're coming to the end of 2022 here. Mm-hmm. Looking back on this year, before we turn to 2023, I should I should show myself on this part of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, so, looking back for the Maverick. Is the Maverick Party in a good spot heading into 2023, do you believe? Yeah, I absolutely do. And this is why. It's not that we have, you know, huge bushels of recognition flowing in from all parts of the, from the Western Canadian landscape yet. But we recognize where we are. We're at the beginning. If we were making a farming analogy, I would say that we're seeding. Right. Every farmer knows that if you want to harvest at the end, you have to do the hard work at the beginning. You know, it's not a lot of of gratification in seeding, not a lot of gratification in in, uh, you know, in fertilizing and and all these here other things. But he does it because he knows there's going to be a harvest at the other end. The goal that we have now and and that's what we're doing in 2022 and and even before we're going to continue into this so that. When. The Canadian public is looking for an option, and I believe that they absolutely will. Because uh, as much as uh, Pierre Polyev uh, talks about Western Canadian politics uh, and, and people are liking that, uh, he's already begun the slow, what another, and I didn't coin the phrase, I've read it, it was another journalist that said he's begun the slow pivot back to center, uh, more Eastern-led uh, political views and one of the one of the things we like to talk about or mention even is that he used to talk a lot about defunding the CBC and he doesn't seem to talk about that anymore and and that's that's telling eventually western canadians are going to realize this as well their focus will become less orientated on just simply getting rid of trudeau and and pivoting back to the the core values the core needs that western canadians have been after since, well, well over a century ago, I always like to point back to the milch cow. I mention it all the time, and people are probably tired of hearing about it, but it's an old cartoon of a cow standing on top of a map of Canada, and it's being fed in the West and being milked in the East. And uh, what most people, uh, well, in until that I... analogy, uh, it's crapping on Atlantic. <laughs> right, you know, it could be, right? But, but then inside of all of that... Uh, what a lot of people may not realize unless they've heard me state this so many times before, I suppose, but it was first printed in 1915, just 10 years after uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan actually had become uh, provinces. So, you know, this is a long standing already back then uh, to quote Preston Manning, I suppose to go backwards, like there was something smelly in the fridge, you know, like there was something wrong and, uh, and, and it still plays today. So that's what, I believe that Western Canadians are slowly going to pivot back towards and they're going to realize that, yes, we want to uh, get a more favorable government in Ottawa, i.e. not re-electing Justin Trudeau and his liberals. Not just that, but we need a government in place or a a system, a, a way in place that we can 
uh, get the things that we need as Western Canadians. And a nationally led uh, CPC government is not going to be able to do it. And we need to be ready so that when they're looking for options, the Maverick Party will be that option. I want to go back to a personal story for you here in 2022. Okay. Because I just got a press release earlier this week that you were acknowledged as oh. one of the top foster parents, if not the top foster parents. In our district. In your district. Yeah. For the Peace River or the Valley View area. Yeah, it's all of Alberta North, I guess. Um, congratulations, oh, first off. Yeah, um, appreciate it. What does it mean for you to be recognized in this way? Because I can imagine... Uh, you don't do it for the awards. You do it because you want to give back to kids who may not have family. Yeah. Um, well, there's Especially a few at things. this time oh. with Christmas coming around. And yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'm going to make you cry, man. Oh, man. I, <laughs> I do get extremely passionate. I, I always say if there's two things that I am extremely passionate about, number one would still be foster care. Uh, I have, I've been lucky to have four kids of my own. And... Uh, they we were looking towards the end of it, and we, my wife and I were just thinking, jokingly, like, hey, we're just starting to get this parenting thing figured out. It'd be a shame to quit now. And uh, so, you know, of course, that's a joke. But uh, we've always said that if you want to change the future, you, you get involved in the life of a child. That's how you do it. And so we had the means. We had the ability. Our family was at that stage. Uh, we had just built a house, actually, and we kind of built our house with this in mind. Um, many of our friends were saying, why are you building such a, such a large house when everybody in your house is going to be moving out? Well, we, we had actually had with the intent of filling it back up. And so we, we do love it. It's not easy, but it is one of the most fulfilling things you can do. So when we were nominated um, by some of our people that work with us inside of the, the foster care system, they nominated my wife and I, and I got to make sure I say her name first, because she is by far uh, the core of this, and she is uh, so good, uh, that we were nominated and ultimately um, accepted as the foster care home of the year in our district. Uh, and um, it's humbling. There's a lot of so many good people that have done this for a lot longer than I have. My wife and I have only been doing this for five or six years. Uh, you know, at this conference we went to where we accepted the award, there was people that had been fostering for decades, like 30 years, and had this list of kids that they had influenced um, through their home and through their just caring that was, as, you know, page after page of kids. So, uh, so uh, you know, I we do our best. We love our kids. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't feel necessarily that we are uh, heads and shoulders above anybody else. But so anyway, well, uh, thank you for that. You are. Oh, according thanks. to your peers, you are. According to your peers, you are. I want to turn to the next year. We're winding down on 2022, 2023 mm -hmm. is a fresh slate. This is going to be the <clears> first <throat> full year that you will be leader. Wow. Like... You are coming up to a year anniversary of being elected leader of the Maverick Party, but you're also coming up to a full year of you being in this position mm -hmm. and only you. What's in store for the Maverick Party for 2023 besides the by-election? What, mm -hmm. what personal goals are you setting for yourself now that you've got almost eight months underneath the belt? What's next? Yep. Uh, next would be uh, membership growth. Um, <clears throat> we want to ex start exponentially hopefully exponentially growing our membership. Uh, we want to work. We want to, now that we've done so much of the foundational work uh, of, of getting the everything kind of ironed out at a foundational level for the Maverick Party, uh, that we want to start pushing outwards. We have a, a great message. It is a common sense message that I believe that many in Western Canada will just immediately gravitate towards. Uh, I want to duplicate what we did once before. We went to a, a large uh, fair called the IPE. It's held yearly in Armstrong, British Columbia. And our local is apparently it's the second largest uh, fair in British Columbia over year over year. And I believe it. Uh, like literally tens of thousands of people. Uh, it's, it's a huge event. And my, my local EDA had phoned up and, and said to me that we want to we want to get a booth would you come and I'm like of course I love this stuff let's go and uh so we had 
they did just a fantastic job. And we just engaged with people as they walked by this booth. And of course, we had some signage up just to try and gather initial attention. And then we would just gauge where they're at and we'd talk with them. And we talked with thousands of people and signed up a lot of members in this two and a half days that I was there. And for every member that we signed up, uh, we would have probably 10 or more people uh, that would go away and say, I like this. I'm not quite ready to sign on the dotted line yet, but I want to look into this more and I promise I will. And I, you know, and of course I, I trust them. I don't know if all of them bought memberships or not. Of course that would be again, a little naive, but they got to hear the Maverick message and they liked it. And that's on the interior of British Columbia. And so uh, our goal now is just to make sure that our current members have uh, the the information that they need that, so that they can tell their friends, their neighbors, their family, their co-workers about the Maverick Party and that we can start to grow this movement. And at this point, that's how I view it. It's more of a movement than a party. Uh, we want to... Uh, we want people when they hear the Maverick name, they don't think about a, a a movie star jet pilot or a riverboat gambler or whatever you whatever pop culture reference you choose to go to. We want them to instead first think of uh, of a a movement inside of Western Canada, you know, at the federal level that will absolutely uh, represent them to their core so that they can think when they think of a federal politician, they don't just immediately dismiss it as something corrupt or useless. Uh, you know, we don't want them to spit when they think of, of the polit of a politician. You know what I mean? What? We want them. To, yeah, Come I know. Right? We want them to, we want them to know that there, that there indeed can be some integrity when it comes to politics. And that's what we want to do for them. That's what I want to do for them. Now, you know what? A core personal goal is that uh, we want to give them uh, very real reasons to believe that. Uh, uh, if I'm going to do any kind of a push, I would encourage everybody that's watching, if you aren't a Maverick member and you want to be involved in something like this, uh, buy a membership. We are in the process of planning an annual, uh, a party-wide annual general meeting that will be held uh, early summer for next year. It'll, it looks like it will be in June. And at that point, at that AGM is where the Maverick membership will be able to vote on all of our, making sure that we are on the right track, that we're staying on the right track, that our actual grassroots has an opportunity to speak, to make sure that we're on track. Um, you know, and, and this to me is, is, is core, it's vital. Uh, I wanna make sure that we are indeed representing all of Western Canadians. And so that'll be at that AGM that you will be able to vote on um, uh, such measures is uh, one of the things that I personally will be uh, giving to our membership to vote on is a, uh, a proper system of recall for our, uh, for our membership. And the reason behind that is, again, I went back to that because of the whole integrity thing. Uh, and it goes all the way back to my uh, run during the last federal election in, uh, in two Septembers ago. And I was out. Yeah, no, right? It's so it does not seem like that long. But I was at a meeting in High Prairie. And there was this, uh, this, this older gentleman in a cowboy hat. And he, he stood up at the end and I'm paraphrasing and uh, man, if you're, if you hear this or you know him, you know, please don't, it's, it's a paraphrase, but he said, Colin, you know what? I like what you say, but I've heard it before. Yeah. I've heard it before. And how do I know that you're any different than any of those other guys? And I look back at him. And I said, that's tough. That's tough for you. It's tough for me. It's tough because you can't know until you give me a try. Like you can't know until I'm actually there because integrity isn't something that you can pick up off the table and say, oh, here's my integrity. I have it. It's mine. You can't do that. It only can be proven over time. Same thing with honesty, right? Anybody who tells you I'm an honest guy, that's okay. That's the first red flag, right? So, and, and I can't, and I'm stuck because I know that I have integrity. I know that I will absolutely do my best to tell the truth. Every time I will be as transparent as I possibly can be every time because that's what the voting public deserves. Yeah. That's how democracy is supposed to work. So I want to do it. Now, fast forward to my leadership campaign. 
and I was hashing over this problem, this problem of how do we show our voting public that we are indeed different. And we talked about recall. Recall, though, is traditionally a really difficult thing to accomplish because most of the models that are in place right now, it takes more votes to get uh, a person out of power than it did to actually put them in power. Plus, half the time, no one wants to ever put forward legislation that will actually allow yeah, them to Yeah, right. Recall. That's right. Uh, every other job in the world, you can fire the guy if he's not doing the job. But don't they call that those elections, though? Uh, but it's an awful long time. What employer wants to be stuck with a bad employee <laughs> for four years and wait, right, for a scheduled election? That's no good. Yeah. And, and there is zero, there is zero uh, incentive for that said employee or MP to do their job, right? Yeah. It keeps us accountable. It keeps us full of integrity, right? And so here's, the, here's what I'm proposing. And this is what makes our plan, my plan, different, is that I'm going to keep it internal at first. So if the Maverick membership and a certain amount of them, let's just pick a number at random, let's say 1,000 or 2,000 Maverick members in any riding get together and say, our guy is not doing the job. We need somebody different. And they sign a petition of recall. They present it to the party, and that will immediately trigger an internal nomination race, at which point that uh, MP, that Maverick MP, will have to justify to his own Maverick members that he deserves the job. And there will be people that will step up to, to run for that position. Now, should he lose that nomination race, according to a contract that he will have had to sign, which will have teeth, by the way, which will prevent him from crossing the floor or sitting simply sitting in as an independent. There will be uh, there will be uh, legal teeth built into that contract to prevent that from happening. He will be required, according to that contract, to step back, vacate the seat. That will trigger the by election. At that point, the guy who won that nomination race inside of the Maverick Party will step forward and contend for that seat. My assertion is is that he will probably win for two reasons. A, the writing already chose the Maverick uh, uh, platform once. They liked the platform. They potentially just didn't like the guy, right? And they get the new guy. And secondly, we have just proven that we are the only party inside of Canadian politics that will make ourselves uh, accountable to the Canadian voter. Yeah. And then, and, you know, and we're going to do it this way. Now, some people have said, oh, man, that could, that could be messy, that could provide. That could bring in a lot of uh, uh, of uh, you know problems, maybe within your own party. And I'm like, maybe, but it's still worth it. Yeah. It's still worth it because that's how democracy is supposed to work, and that's what our voting public deserves. So this is one of the things that uh, it's not part of our platform yet because it needs to be voted in by our members. So if you like the idea of that, become a Maverick member and help me bring it in. And how can they do that through the website? Yeah. yeah. Calling people? How can they do that? Uh, so the easiest way is, uh, you know, everybody's on the internet these days. So go to what? Maverick. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Everybody, even even old people like me. Then you go uh, you go and you, you uh, go to maverickparty.ca, www.maverickparty.ca. Links are in the show notes for oh. those who want to know. <laughs> You're great. And and then just click on the membership tab and, uh, and join us. Uh, you know, that is one of the great benefits to being a member and not just a voter in the future is that you have a say. So, Colin, uh, I, I, I always find these conversations fascinating. Um, I always I never know what I'm expecting when I go <laughs> into these conversations, especially about the year in review. But I can honestly say out of the 488 interviews I've done on this show, you are the only person I can probably say. I know exactly the man you're talking about when you're talking about that high prairie cowboy hat because I probably was at the exact same debate four years before that and met the exact same. That guy. I bet you. We have a common we have a common past. Who knew High Prairie would bring the Mavericks and the former liberals together? That's right. You know, oh man. Yeah. Uh, he he I, I always joke a little bit because he's one of those guys that you can't really tell how old he is. He's either he's somewhere in between 50 and 90 because because yeah. he he might look like he's on the older end of the scale but he moves like he's on the younger end of that scale and frankly you just don't mess with those guys you just don't mess with them they're no they're, you don't but um i want to thank you um 
I, 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 we've chat, we've chatted twice on this show so far, but these conversations have helped me a lot. And this is the part of time when you got weepy for a few minutes there a while <laughs> back. I'm going to get weepy here for a few seconds here. Um, we, 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 we've lost the ability to talk to each other. And I thank you uh. for helping me talk to people again and talk to people like yourself who have graciously given over their time this year to <laughs> sit down and talk to me, whether it be you up in Valley View, me down in Calgary or face to face like we're doing right now. Um, a lot of people know that I've been going through some health issues right now, and I still am, and I don't know what my surgery is going to be like here on the second, so this is airing after it, but your gracious acceptance to come on the show and sit down with me means more than you probably could imagine, oh. and again, we, we barely know each other from Adam, <laughs> but the two times that you've been on, I have always loved the conversation, so... Thank you so much for uh, being on the show again. I I love this. I don't know how else to say it. Even when I was in Armstrong, as you can as you can imagine, it's there's 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 the the full political spectrum there. Yeah. You don't see that just everywhere as pronounced as it, right? And so we'd have come people that would come by and they you could tell that they weren't necessarily they weren't in love with the Maverick platform and they would stand there and they still wanted to talk. And I saved those guys for me. I kind of instructed the rest of the, the, the Maverick guys that were there. I said, leave them for me. I want to talk to them because we have to talk. We have to talk. And so I appreciate you more than I can say. So thank you. I'm going to cry. Well, don't do that. Uh, I know. But here <laughs> we are. Um, but thank you so much for sitting down. Um, so with that... Before I actually do start bawling my eyes out here. <laughs> um, if you want to learn more about the Maverick Party, the links are in the show notes. So scroll down. If you're listening to this on YouTube, if you're driving and listening to this, please pull mm -hmm. over and then scroll down. Um, <laughs> because I don't want you to be distracted driving because I've lost someone to uh, distracted driving. So please don't. <laughs> um, get out from behind social media. Put down your Twitter. I know it's all great and special right now. But put down social media and go have a conversation with someone like Colin and I did today. You'd be surprised at what you can learn, how you can educate yourself, and how it can be better for democracy when we talk to each other and not yell into the void that is social media. We have more in common than we know. So with that, have yourself an excellent day, everyone. And remember, keep talking. Keep talking.